Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. I think we should get started. Um, I think I pretty much know everybody here. I've just met some people here, but I'm Sarah um, Johnson, and I run Carnegie Hall's Wild Music Institute, which is the Hall's Education and Community Programs arm, as you know. Um, we're in the new Resnick Education Wing. Welcome, if this is your first time. Um, we just opened the space this fall. And it's, yeah, really exciting. Um, and really, we're just thrilled to host this discussion um, among artists who are doing similar kinds of work all over the world. And um, mostly, jo I think, John, and really for you guys to, um, to frame this conversation, we were happy to dig in in whatever way. And I think we should just ask quickly to make sure everyone's comfortable filming. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, why we're filming the conversation? Oh, yes. Um, there is a lot of people in the Netherlands who would have loved to be here now. <laughs> and so when I explained the things that I was intending to do, uh, not just this week in the United States, but also the coming years, people said, ah, oh, it's exciting. I promised them to make a film. And if you're okay with it, we just film it and we might cut a few, yeah, just useful things and uh, share it with, um, yeah, professional uh, audience. If not, of course, uh, speak up. Yeah. We're fine. Great. <laughs> Great. Vincent, by the way, also. Hi, Vincent. Oh, Hi. Nice to meet you. A Dutch man, but living here. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. So I'm, I'm obviously delighted to be here. Um, many of you I work with on an almost daily basis, or at least uh, daily. And, and uh, it's a bit of a reunion, actually, to have Doc here, Wendy, Wendy, Tom, all of you. <laughs> it's just thrilling. Um, and we, I think, are involved as, as artists, um, decidedly not in the, in the ivory tower uh, model that, that really obtained post-war in this country, particularly with the, the artists and particularly the composer uh, closeted from the, from the public and from, uh, especially from young people. And, and uh, I think we're all committed to that. My, my title for this is actually the artist as social activist uh, with a sometime reaching out risks and responsibilities. Not that they should all begin with R. <laughs> but, um, uh, I, I do want to, to make this uh, a substantive discussion, uh, not, just, not just on a philosophical level, because I think basically we all agree and, and I have a considerable political background in, in New York with uh, groups back in the 70s and all. Um, and, and it can easily um, degenerate into bickering and sectarianism you know, when you're talking about action. But I think, or I mean about philosophy and you know, politics with a small letter P. Um, <clears throat> so I think what we want to do here is to talk about, uh, as, as Merline says, how we can cooperate with each other because we represent several major institutions. Um, is Jennifer's not coming? Jennifer could not come. No. Kessler, okay. you mean? Yeah. For all Kessler, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, but we're, we're, we're still, you know, and you're representing St. Luke's. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. How we can cooperate intra -or organizationally, and as Marilyn says, uh, with non-musical organizations, uh, which Carnegie probably has the most experience uh, in, uh, more than the Philharmonic, I think. Uh, so we can use your wisdom, those of you, uh, as much as possible. Um, it seems to me that there are two kind of wings of the art that are represented here there's the educational and performance-oriented uh, art, um, which is, of course, epitomized by probably El Sistema, but also by Carnegie, St. Luke's, and several other organizations. Um, El Sistema is, 
is around the world and very, very pervasive and very successful. And we, uh, and there's probably nobody at this table that doesn't have deep respect for uh, Maestro Abreu's work, or Dr. Abreu, whatever they call him, the Maestro, I call him. But anyway, um, so that's one uh, part of it. And the other one is more composing uh, uh, representative, which obviously uh, is where my line is coming from, and myself with, oh yeah, come on. Wow. This is Bill Gore, the uh, master storyteller, and my buddy for years and years. Grab a chair. Yeah. It's oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so, um, the, so I was I, I was speaking about of course Bill represents a kind of third third wing of that. He's he's obviously in, in education, works with kids all the time. Um, and it's also a musical performer too. He plays a mean banjo while he, while he tells stories, and he's working uh, extensively in New York City schools, and also recently in Peru, uh, developing a program there in the schools. Anyway, I was saying that there's the education emphasis, and then there's the composing emphasis, and obviously we want to bring the two together because uh, we, we don't. You know, it's, that's the old, again, the old model. The performer over here and the composer there tells the performer what to do. And we're, we're over that. <laughs> but still, there, there is a, uh, an, an emphasis. And so my, my very young composer, BYC, is, is obviously what I'm, where I'm coming from. So uh, what I want to do is, I think Merlin needs to... Uh, I want to hear from Melan. I've had fairly extensive discussions with him, and we have collaborated on a partially symbolic but in reality it, uh, connection via the Netherlands to the Middle East from New York, uh, which has already reaped uh, some small but tangible rewards. And results. And I Some think tears in the concert hall. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But uh, uh, and this aspect of the work, and you guys can inform us on that. You too. Um, that comes into the risks and responsibilities stuff. So we. Uh, it's not just that we, we go into these neighborhoods, or we go into the hospitals, or we go into the prisons, or so on. We have a, once we enter those doors or, or, of a country where there's a large refugee population, or a, or a, a, a religious problem, let's say, with with women speaking their mind, or so on. Um, we run a risk, or they run a risk, and we have a responsibility. Okay. Um, and uh, Rachel can speak to this too in, in New York City schools. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so anyway, I, I think that's, that's enough kind of just framing the discussion, um, how we can deepen our work, how we can cooperate amongst each other and learn to work effectively with non-musical organizations. To me, that's a, that's a biggie. So, uh, and a big question, of course, when it's 5.30, will we be satisfied? <laughs> Which is, of course, impossible. And also, which brought us to saying, let's not all make long introductions, because if we make a round, then we will certainly be half an hour um, further away. I want my people back home and others uh, that they, they can, can lo look things up, you know, they can, can Google you. But still, it would be lovely to speak and to, to see if you can add, of course, also mention your name. It's good that we can trace you down, maybe later, uh, also for the, uh, for the video. Mention your name and see if you can uh, uh, summarize in a few words uh, what you're doing, but also what's your dream. I'm, I mean, it's maybe 
a bit harsh to say I'm not interested in what you're really doing now because the situation is so different from where I am but I'm very interested to know where you want to go because there we might meet so that's why I, I love to hear just a little bit what's your dream is that okay yeah but let's try to keep it very condensed <laughs> Let's start. Short <laughs> Hi, my name's uh, Brendan Walsh. Uh, my work sort of comes together in the classical music rave, which is basically an all-night party, uh, but then on with classical music, and I combine that with an education side, teaching at conservatoire and module of cultural entrepreneurship, and also with serious mission. Uh, which is in Jordan giving music workshops and training teachers to um, develop basically the idea of the, the expression and to process the past and things that have happened. And we my did that together. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, my dream is uh, quite simple. Um, I believe that the world can always be more beautiful, mm -hmm. um, and I think that the arts have got. All skills, oh, pardon me, all skills necessary uh, to actually make that happen as well. Um, and for that one side remark, I think the one thing that's stopping many people of doing so is the market economy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it okay? okay. Um, I'm Rachel Shapiro. Um, I was a classical violist and teaching artist for many years and recently um, started working for the Department of Education as the Manhattan Borough Arts Director. In that role, I support K through 12 students in districts one through seven, um, meeting all of their arts pro pro programming needs and um, expanding what current arts offerings are in schools. Yeah. Uh, my dream is to go into any school on any day in any borough of Manhattan or of the, of the city and see um, equal access and offerings to all the students in these buildings. Amazing, yeah. Is there still a dream for <laughs> this, <laughs> this place? <laughs> um, well, I'll just really briefly say the work is broad, so it's K to 12. There's also a lot of activity um, in correctional facilities, healthcare settings, homeless shelters, there's work with families, there's young artists training, including running the National Youth Orchestra, which tours internationally. Um, so, and there's media and technology that supports all of that. So there are quite a lot of different frames. Um, I think, ultimately, I believe that music can make a very significant difference in the lives of all people. And I'm most particularly interested in um, those who have had few opportunities and advantages. So I don't have one concrete, clear dream, but that's what we think about um, across environments, from maximum security, prisons, to um, family homeless shelters. Hi, my name is Bayatha Moon. I'm a pianist and a composer and teaching artist. And I work with John at New York Philharmonic, but I've also done a lot of work at Lincoln Center Education and some at Carnegie. And just this past year, or I know many of you know Russell Granite, who's now the head of Lincoln Center Education, and he really also has a similar mission to reach out to everyone, especially those who are underprivileged, who may not have arts exposure. So this past year I've been involved with Arts in the Middle, which is bringing arts to middle schools and also in areas where they need it most. So I found that the consistency of like having a regular teaching artist be there and getting to know the community. So I know what you're saying when you're saying that other organizations other than arts need to be a part of it because that's a big part of the community. But my dream would be to, I also believe that the arts and music can make the world a better place and that <laughs> um, just to reach out, especially to the the children, and, and not only children, but the people who don't have the access, just to give them a chance to um, give them the tools to make their lives better, because I think art, the arts can really do that. Yeah. So tools is empowering. Yes, empowering. exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Andrew Roidstein, and I'm a bassist, um, arranger, and teaching artist. I've worked for Carnegie, I work for New York Philharmonic, and I'm in the two maestro and quintet. And my, I guess the dream is for music to 
I don't know, for people to have to be, um, to, for music to be able to cause like and instigate cultural openness um, through all sorts of genres of music is, is, is the main thing. So for, for people to like, the, so the dream is, and this is like a kind of lofty, but for people to get out of just being like, I want to do this through bringing classical music to these audiences, but but for people across the board to kind of just look at music as a lot of broader thing to culturally connect people. Like a language rather than a fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm Justin Hines, and um, I'm a per uh, <coughs> I'm a percussionist and a composer, a teaching artist, and um, work in many different genres of music and for many different people in many different places. So it's a, it depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the hour. <laughs> yes, yeah, the hour. The hour. Speaking of that, I want to find out more about this rave thing. <laughs> what an idea. Um, so I had five people in advance of me to get ready for my dream, so <laughs> no pressure. Um, there so, well, there's so many, but I'm just going to focus on one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and this is, this is a dream that I have, and I don't know how to do it, because it, it deals with culture bro broadly, is that um, I work with Wendy in a chamber music ensemble, and um, you know, we play for, for basically two types of audiences. We play for children, and then we play for mostly mostly retired people at our subscription concerts. And there isn't a whole lot of room in the middle there in terms of the audience demographic. And, I'm, and it's, it's not, uh, my dream then is I'm wondering what, what thing can be started now that is going to move through the ranks of the conservatories and through the training and through the art that will lead to um, this high quality musical experience being relevant not to this, these two far outside parts of the society and to culture, right? Only people that have enough money and free time to go to a concert. Only kids who have an arts program brought to them during the school day, right? They're both totally valid. So my dream, one of my dreams is to find out what we could do in a long-term process to bring this kind of high-quality arts experience back to the middle of the culture and not at the fringes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Chris Amos. <laughs> I'm uh, Chris Amos, Director of Educational Media and Technology for Carnegie Hall's Wild Music Institute. So I work very closely with Sarah on the very broad range of education <laughs> programs here at the Hall. Um, and I think similarly, it's hard to articulate just one dream, um, but we do ask ourselves all the time how, you know, how music can make a difference in people's lives, and are we doing the best thing that we can for people's lives through music? And um, as a technologist trying to kind of answer that question, it presents lots of interesting challenges. Um, so I guess I, I dream of future technologies that help make that better, help us do that work better. Cool. I'm Bill Gord. Um, I'm a storyteller. Uh, I developed storytelling curriculum, and I mostly work with really young kids. And I guess, um, and I, as John mentioned, I'm, I'm working with a, a group of schools. I just started in Lima, Peru, the Nova schools, and they just hired me to create storytelling curriculum for all. They have 30 schools for their early childhood programs. So I, I think my dream comes really more about them than about me which is that I think that stories set them up to be able to articulate their dreams. And if they can articulate them, then there's more of a chance of them coming true. Mm -hmm. And I think both music and stories have the potential to have kids start to understand what the possibilities of the world are. So that's kind of my thing. And I'm uh, Thomas Cadmus. I'm a composer and as a teaching artist for Carnegie Hall, um, I work on musical creativity with kids um, in elementary school, primarily third, fourth, and fifth grade, um, but then also with teenagers writing songs and with young parents writing lullabies for their children. 
Um, and I also I teach at Juilliard, so I work with conservatory students on their musical creativity. And I guess my dream is really <laughs> that um, this, this shared vision that we have of, at this table of musical creativity should inhabit center stage of places like Carnegie Hall and the New York Philharmonic and the Concert Gabal and all, you know, and, and that in doing that, hopefully, we break down the myths that exist around musical creativity. For instance, that you have to have learned music theory before you compose, <laughs> which is for me is a big one. And um, if we could break down that myth through some of that work, I would be a very happy man. <laughs> I'm David Wallace, AKA Doc Wallace, after 20 years of, as a teaching artist in New York City working for most organizations, 14 years Juilliard faculty, uh, 17 years at the New York Philharmonic. I am now chair of the string department of Berkeley College of Music in Boston, where I run the world's most eclectic and creative string department, hands down. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's daunting. I have to work with senior administration, all the other departments at a music school that has roughly 4,500 students. Whoa. And in my own department, I've got students from South America, the Middle East, all Europe, Ireland, so many different global styles. And the paradigm at Berkeley is every person is a composer, a producer, an arranger, a creator. Yeah. And it feels very Rockstar. much, <laughs> yes. you know, and, and not only that, but there's also majors that are business and therapy. And so it's, it's like even if you are not making your income as a performer, that does not mean that you're a musician. Everybody at Berkeley is a musician, from the janitors who have their own bands and demos, <laughs> to the president who can play drums. <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, it's a wild and creative place to be. And part of my dream is I really want to help string education, especially in America, from the very beginning all the way through the postgraduate level. And I, on a more global scale, not global as in world, but global as an outside the string world, I really like Tom I, and everybody is I want to see that every person on this earth has full access to the creative birthright. Mm -hmm. That they can say, yes, I am a musician, yes, I am a singer, yes, I am a composer. And in terms of what happens with the music industry itself, I really am anxious in helping the paradigm shift from idolization to communication, so that we are not just venerating great performers, but we are interacting as great communicators and creating dialogue across cultures and transforming lives and transforming identities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I follow all of this. But um, my name is Wendy Law. I'm a cellist. I've been a teaching artist for many years with the New York Philharmonic. Um, I'm the artistic director of a chamber ensemble called Classical Jam. And I like to think that we collaborate with presenters, audiences, composers, and performers to create a meaningful musical experience. And also, this is something really strange, but I'm going to share it publicly now, um, <laughs> and I'm coming out. <laughs> but uh, I'm also a YouTuber. I, I do um, makeup on YouTube. So I'm a social media expert. And so one of my dreams is to see how I can use the power of social media to connect to young people. Um, and so I'm like ready to do that right about now. Um, so and also to keep doing what I'm doing, I feel like I'm already living my dream through my ensemble and, and concerts. I do interactive concerts, so I want to keep doing more. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, so <laughs> I have work. no idea what's left to say. <laughs> <laughs> you really got me with that one. <laughs> um, no, okay, so I'm a, I'm a composer. And um, I'm also a, a pianist and conductor, and I, I run a new music ensemble in New York, and I teach with John and uh, at the New York Film. And you know, I, I guess I came out of this a little differently because I came out through the university system, not through the conservatory, so I did a PhD in San Diego. I actually studied in The Hague for a while. <laughs> and, and then, so coming through the university and teaching at the university for a while, it was, that was a big challenge for this reason because, um, you know, I, 
I'm kind of fluid with how I do music. I kind of got into conducting. I got, you know, I went back into piano, uh, into electronics, and and I feel like that's such a essential part of being an active, creative musician. You know, like what Tom and Dave uh, David are talking about, and that was very difficult at the university. And so, you know, I think for me, part of part of my dream is always to make a moment in time, like an actual experience, more meaningful. Mm -hmm. So when you hear something, you're just so loaded up that when you actually experience, like we today we have the Mendelssohn. I know that I could just feel that these kids were completely loaded with how they were hearing this music. <laughs> and they they just burst out, you know, and like they were so excited to hear it. And and that's why I perform so much to kind of experience that. So what my dream is from that, I don't know. <laughs> to find, you know, to find ways to, yes, it's great to be able to do all these things, but it's actually, it's all with the goal of like creating these experiences that the more you put into them, the more you can get out of them. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Clara, and I'm probably the youngest person I've seen, so I feel kind of to me. Um, but I am a recently graduate of Radio Fellow, or Sistema Fellow from NBC, and I'm a um, teaching artist with the Youth Orchestra of St. Luke's, as well as the Bridge Program with John. Um, and I'll be going to medical school next year. Um, and my dream is for positive community development, period. Um, and specifically, the rest of the United States, because that's where I feel my reach is. Um, but more specifically, um, the in intersection between music and medicine, and how music can facilitate healing in ways that medicine currently does not think. The United States, um, and there's just so much that is good about medicine and music, but for some reason, it's just like this. And I, I, I my dream is to bring it together. That because they, if you bring two powerful forces together, then it's just going to be one gigantic powerful force. You know what I mean? So that's very short. Amazing. Yeah. So I don't want, you've heard enough from me already, but um, I'm just reacting to all the, all the wonderful uh, galvanizations of, of lives around me and all the abilities that are behind all these, these, uh, these concepts and, and ideas. I mean, perhaps uh, I, I don't want to paint a negative picture, but I, uh, because I feel positively, I feel ex kind of elated right now seeing you guys, and it always elates me to, to hear children uh, present their composition with a major symphony orchestra. I mean, that's just, you know, that makes me alive just to see that. But I view, uh, I basically, I mentioned politics before, I view the world basically as in deep crisis. I mean, in a kind of Mahler sense, you know, mankind <laughs> in deepest need. I really do, and um, I, I, it's it's really it's it's gone beyond the, the kind of annoying uh, moderate to that. I mean, it really is quite quite ridiculous now. And of course, I'm maybe have you may be the youngest at the table. I obviously <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one who has a memory of World War Two. I mean, okay, so, um, but. Uh, but uh, I'm with Merlin in specifically in that um, the the arts need they have a responsibility to be at the center of life and to be um, not so much instructive but just a spiritual positive uh, expressive force in in life and I think that there's enough unanimity here, at least, uh, of, of intent that we could actually get something somewhere done. And I'm going to look to you uh, and whoever you, you know, can, can connect with uh, specifically um, to help us uh, reach out beyond New York City and to uh, uh, even beyond Europe or, or the, the advanced Asian nations. Uh, into uh, areas of the world where where these crises that I talk about are really already evident. So uh, that's, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to hear all this. So 
Uh, it, it's indeed a, a very <coughs> double feeling. I mean, what, what is expressed, I mean, it's so powerful, and I know it from my experience about the power of music, the power of art. Um, I discovered basically that everybody is an artist. <laughs> we worked in refugee camps, places where children have really traumatic uh, things in their past, and their present situation is very stressful. So there is no space in the mind for uh, hope or optimism and so on. If you start making music, they're artists. Mm -hmm. It comes out, you know? Sometimes it takes a long time, but it comes out. I, we can, well, I can tell a lot of, ex give a, really examples. So that's very, very inspiring. Same moment, the, the counter force is also so huge. Uh, all the ways that people get distracted, mm -hmm. all the ways people get uh, influenced, especially when well, you talk about crisis, you know, which is, goes hand in hand with fear and with all kinds of worries that make people very narrow-minded. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful that I can be a musician. Uh, imagine being a visual artist that people can just screen the way they screen websites all day long. It's a check, 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 and in a half an hour they've seen a museum, you know? <laughs> and a composer, you can say, okay, you sit down, it will take 20 minutes. <laughs> and then you can build this experience, you know? So it's, it's wonderful. And my biggest, indeed, question for this afternoon, are there other professions who might have a meeting at this moment in a different building, feeling like, why are we just with a neuroscientist together, seeing all these things happening, with whom can we connect, or with the future of education, with the future of uh, uh, national security? <laughs> I mean, uh, there are different fields uh, where I feel that we that might happen a collaboration and if it happens if we can really make that type of sparks across these silos <coughs> I think we can make an impact if we're in a few years still in this <laughs> place with us together well everyone is maybe just a little bit more exhausted you know <laughs> and have done maybe nice incidents but that's not change, it's not a movement. Can yeah, I add something to that? Yeah, I have a question for you, but you add first. Um, the, uh, the, the something in the Netherlands and other countries as well, they're sort of saying the creative industries are uh, a top economic sector. You know, they've done the research and now, lo and behold, we're actually worth quite a lot. <laughs> um, but, it, and it just depends on the way you calculate it, what I've been trying to implement in the way we talk about the arts as well, is not say, look, we're not a sector. Don't put us between medicine, don't put us between automotive or wherever you like. Uh, what we do is we develop creativity, indeed. We, we, we learn to speak with different languages. We feed, if we want to think in the market economy, we feed all these different sectors. Um, and what, I, what I'm trying to get to do with my students and with, with people in the arts is let's not accept that we are put in one of these places, um, but actually reach out indeed and say, look, look at what we're doing. We're, we're a sort of a, we're a feeding ground, um, and we can actually make the things you do open up and bloom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was um, so I, I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, one of them is that I I agree with you. The world seems more in crisis than ever. Um, I'm not sure that it really is. What we've gotten really good at is sharing the horrible things that are happening all over the place. And what we are really not good at is talking about the great things that happen all the time. Um, represented around this table and around many other tables in many other buildings all over the world. There are lots of people doing amazing work. So I think we have problems around um, media and the stories that we tell and the stories that people are interested in. and the entertainment industry, all of those things. Um, so I just, I wanted to say that. My question for you is, because um, you say you, you don't want this to be the same table in a year, right? You want a different movement. And I guess, or my, my slight challenge to that is there are lots of people doing work across music with other sectors. Yeah. You know, we're doing a, a fair amount of it, but we're 
Tiny in the universe of of people doing there's very rich and interesting work happening with music and medicine, right? There's interesting work bubbling around social justice issues. There are very important conversations around education and music. Those are a little bit challenging in the United States right now, in part because largely I think because of the way they're framed. Um, but there are there are lots of of places where there is overlap with music and other sectors. So. Tell us more about about what you what you, about your dream. What it is that you want to have happen? Is it really about a specific movement and international collaborations? Is yeah. it getting the story out more? Mm -hmm. Is it yeah. ten other things? Well, <laughs> building on the fact that a sector like you described is boxing it in. Uh, my dream is to well get free of the box, mm -hmm. and that is, has everything to do with a sense of place. Where are the arts placed? Mm -hmm. If you open a map, you see very often, very clearly indicated, there is a museum, there is a concert hall, uh, like the big cultural landmarks, they always have, or often have, beautiful buildings, mm -hmm. so you can see that's the place for art. If you open the time out, you see what's the time for art, so the place in our schedule is 8 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, so that we have that's a sense of place in the, in the physical sense, sense of place in the time-wise, and then we have also the place in our own lives. I mean, we read a book or we watch a artistic movie in our own time, you know, in our free time, and then we go to work or then we have other obligations. So, I um, have, there is a, a graph I want to show, but. I'll, I'll, uh, it's somewhere on my computer, but I can also show it with my arms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have the things that we think we know. Uh, it goes very quick. You think you become an expert in something. Then starts the moment you realize you actually are not that expert. <laughs> and it goes down. So the more you actually know, it goes very slowly, the more you know that you don't know. Can you follow that? Yeah. So there is a, a graph which is the uh, realization that tells yourself I'm not an expert and that is totally down and it starts going up when the other starts show it's like a, a bubble of, of belief. You say I'm not an expert. You know that you don't know. It goes very steep and so at some moment you know that you don't know anything and your real knowledge is very limited. Mm -hmm. And then real knowledge is growing steadily, you know? I feel there, there is this big bubble presented by the media with a lot of instant knowledge that all feeds our uh, confidence. And we think, ah, we know a lot because it's, it's told us seven reasons why this or five reasons why that. <laughs> Check it. Okay, remember that. <laughs> um, and then comes the time that you start realizing this gap between what you know and what you are consciously conscious of, I feel there is a place for heart. There is a great situation, and it can be in your work or in your personal life, in the relationship with your kids, if you feel that there is more, which is impossible just with your brains to understand, but it's there. And you feel it's not, the bubble is, some way over, you, you start realizing it's not enough to, to check it a magazine or to just Google it. You need to investigate it. And there, arts can play a part. Because art can really deepen your sense of reality with not words, with other things than words. Is there a chart for to feel? <laughs> well, I believe the fact that there is this, this uh, the, the big difference between what you feel there is mm -hmm. And what you know, that's a, a lot of intuition, a lot of emotion, or that is the a region of feeling where the arts ha are the language of feeling. Could you give an example? Like a, I understand what you're saying, yeah. especially, but I yeah. would love to give an example of how, how art could help in that space. Yeah. Well, maybe indeed, if you, uh, the difference between cultures. If you read a newspaper, you know a lot about Palestine and Israel, or a lot about Syria. And then, if you travel there, you suddenly start feeling like, I don't know anything. The reality is so different. 
and you feel it as confusion, uh -huh. but sometimes also as wonder. Mm -hmm. And it can feel like, wow, life is mysterious. There is no good and bad. It's all part of very blurry, mysterious thing. And then if you start investigating, r building a relationship, then still, I mean, I've been maybe 20 times in the Middle East, I don't understand it. But I have a relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. I know people, I know I've been there, I, I feel it. So, and especially when I make music together, mm -hmm. or when I, I created, well, situations with children, they express their anger or happiness or their emotions. I just understand them, you know? But if you ask me, tell me, um, will they be good or bad when they're old? <laughs> You know, no, no words are... I cannot describe it in words. Does that make a composer an architect of feelings? Um, that for me is a, a very 20th century uh, <laughs> approach to see artists as creators. I think, I mean, creation is something that's in every person. So to confiscate it, to say, I'm an artist, it's mine. I'm the creator here. I think that's a crime. So y you, you take actually, well, um, the creativity away. And the f actually, the thing is, people love that. Because creativity and investigation, it's also about your insecurity. Because it's about what a mystery, you know, wonder. And if you go with different clash between different cultures, it's, there is it's confusion. And, People are very happy not to be in a confused situation. So I believe the audience learned in just a hundred years to outsource their own insecurity to artists. They say, ah, Andy Warhol is so confused, great. Or another artist can really put in, in well, express kind of yeah, crisis or problems or things in troubling the mind. And the audience can just label that and say, oh, that's an artwork, and continue living in their secure, safe world, you know? So how do we get everyone to think more creatively, and how do we tie in all these different organizations who are trying to do that? Like, how do we do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how about, uh, you all have, a, a, you're good with words, that was clear in the round. Um, that's, the communication thing is something that's necessary and we tend to forget, my, that's my opinion, in the arts world that not everybody is that way. Mm -hmm. um, one of my smaller dreams, which I couldn't fit in before, is I would love to see arts happen on every street corner. Well, actually everywhere, but let's start from street corners. Um, and in, in, in an idea like that, and in answering your question, how would we do that? You reach out to the communities around you, you see how far that stretches, you know you can't compose it yourself, you know that everybody can do it, but you know there's more than enough people on every street corner to go and do it. And then finding the, the, a way to actually trigger people, and reaching back to you, um, we're very good in talking about fear, um, and, and that's something that people have grasped. Turn it around. Is it actually possible? Because one, I think you sort of said, "I want to make the world a better place," and apologised for it. I didn't mean to apologise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So sorry. <laughs> sorry for apologising. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, no, no. <laughs> it's a great. That's exactly the thing, though, isn't it? If, if, if we as as artists or as creative people do this, how can we then convince other people to do it? They like seeing troubled people and, and being able to project their feelings on someone else and say, oh, I'm so happy I'm not an artist, or mm -hmm. a famous person. At the same time, turn it around and say, look, life is fantastic. Alice in Wonderland, did you like it, did you not like it? We can actually just create this now. Why don't we go outside and start singing outside and see how the people react? <laughs> that's, but that's how we start it. And if then there's a few masterminds behind it saying, right, let's do this in a kind of a structured way, so we can see and measure that it's happening, I think that's one, one direction to go there. Of course, your question was also pretty practical. And if there is a space that we are looking for insecurity among other organizations, 
And, and as an artist, we learn to ask questions instead of make products. <laughs> and if we can really share uh, or, or have great questions about others, well, about insecure situations, and then uh, yeah, find a way to co-design a form for addressing these yeah, uh, insecurities in an or uh, artistic way, but maybe it's not only artwork, you know, it's all, it can, might be really be connected to, well, the situation or the context of a uh, specific organization or a partner or a school or whatever where they have, so I, I, I don't want to, to solve cr uh, the crisis, I just want to look for where is there still space where people don't have the, where, well, where people are s searching for, for you know, words, the, the insecurity. The I think that there are lots and lots of places where interesting, creative, collaborative work can happen when you enter into the situation asking questions. Yeah. And I'll just give an example of a place where people might not think that exists, mm -hmm. and we've actually found there's a lot of interest, um, which is in the juvenile justice system here in New York City. Um, which is a big system that's under reform at the moment. And the way we've approached that is, is very much along the lines of co-design. We think about responsive programming. So we started out by asking the people who oversee that system and the people who run those facilities and the people who work with young people, what are the needs? What are the challenges? What are, what, what are the circumstances? What would be most useful and helpful and um, effective with young people, and what are you trying to accomplish? Yeah. What do you see as the needs of these young people that could be met in order to help them transition into having a different kind of experience in the world? And what would happen if you ask, what are your doubts? Oh, Because we, needs, they might be very clear, this is what we well, need. They, they talk about their doubts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. I'm using that specifically yeah. as an example because I think very often, um, we, in, in our field, um, can approach things thinking that we know what the answers are. Like, we want to do this kind of thing. Instead of asking a bunch of questions and getting a sense of, uh, a better sense of the environment, um, because there is so much we don't know. You know, that's one of the big things. Like, wow, when we started working in correctional facilities, we knew that there was so much we didn't know. Yeah. And that we didn't even know what we didn't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. No. Is, there <laughs> is there a way that you can share, I mean, I don't mean now, but more a forum to share your ignorance with yeah, audience? We, we actually have, um, have done some or, things to try to, to try yeah. to do that. We shared a whole bunch of things online and in other, yeah. in other contexts. Yeah. Um, we've done a lot of conferences around this uh -huh. um, work. But I just use that as an example in, yeah. um, in response to, your, to what you were just yeah. saying. So I see it as a, as a big dilemma. I, yeah, could I just, I'm really sorry I have to leave, but I just wanted to throw one bit of information into this great discussion. Um, you know, I'm also fascinated with how we can be creative without necessarily creating art. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's, I think, a very fruitful area for collaboration outside of the arts as well. Um, and I'm reminded of George Lewis, the, the trombonist and scholar and composer, you know, and he's, his big um, work right now is called Improvisation as a Way of Life. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how improvisation is basically the first thing we learn as children, mm -hmm. yeah. as, as babies. And we lead our lives through improvisation and they get solidified into how to do things. But actually, if you continue to just be creative yeah. with everything you do, it makes it much more fluid when you're kind of dealing with art or not dealing with art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Anyways, cool. I just wanted to throw that in. Um, I look forward to hearing how this continues. Yeah, yeah. Apologies, I have to leave. Thanks, you. Oh, great. Okay. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I feel like this end of the table. No. It's a bit. We're talking a lot. We should. <laughs> we should get this end of the table to talk more. <laughs> so we're gonna be quiet. <laughs> or I am. <laughs> I could add on to something that Sarah said that actually that I think is very specific and might be helpful in this context. 
and it, uh, about responsive programming. And it's the story of the cultural exchange activities of Carnegie Hall in secondary schools. And we, uh, in the first few years that I was here at Carnegie Hall, we had a, a cultural exchange program that worked with schools internationally. And I think one of the big um, areas of learning for us in implementing that program was the necessity of doing needs assessment with the partner schools and that the needs and predispositions and expectations were going to vary greatly depending on which city we were doing that program in. Um, that we couldn't just take a model that was designed by American educators with uh, you know, an understanding of the American system in mind and, and kind of do it cookie cutter across the different sites. And so the more we think about cultural exchange activities and international you know, communities from different places coming together, I think the more important the needs assessment element becomes as well. And, and looking at, you know, we could, we did that for a while, and sort of, sort of collaboratively designed with teachers in Turkey and India and Mexico. And, but, but ultimately, it, that, the, the work that we were doing, the way that we were doing that, the curricular approach, being in schools, trying to connect with curriculums, ended up not really making any sense in relationship to what it was we were trying to accomplish. Because in India, for example, there was so much interest in this model that was much more around um, inquiry that, that the schools constantly wanted to shift teachers because they saw it as a great professional development opportunity. Mm -hmm. We were like, no, 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 we need sustained relationships between teachers and kids. Yeah. Um, so that also just opens this can of worms around the complexity of intention and what's actually meaningful mm -hmm. across cultures. Yeah. You know, it's, I think it's a complicated question. I said I was gonna stop. <laughs> is, is there a, because sometimes I feel there is a market of needs and problems. People express, ah, we have a need here, we have a need there, and can we shift attention to some place or get donations for some place or make a program there, and there's almost a competition of people who are in need. Um, I don't see a market or a competition in good questions. And imagine that there is a great questions or dilemmas coming out of the work that, that we are doing, I wish there was a place I could share it. Because mm. I have a lot of questions when I leave a, an incidental project in the Middle East, you know, and I would love if there would be, have been others to say like, oh, that's a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. I love to relate to that in order that it's not all with me. Mm -hmm. So is there a place to share? Or I wish. I, no, I don't know. Facebook. Um, well, yeah. maybe. I had like, there's so many different things that are kind of bubbling up in this conversation. And there's so many, like you're saying, there's people with so many skills and expertise in this table. Um, but there are, there, are, um, there, there, there are a few kind of uh, arguments I want to throw out there and see what some reactions are. Um, one would be sort of the technology side of things, right? And another one would be the market side of things. You had mentioned market and technology. And um, I'm wondering, we're all, it sounds like to me like we're all, we're all basically on the same page with having these very shared dreams and visions that involve community, right? And communication, access to the arts, and meaningful arts experiences. But I also see rising these two other kind of opposing forces. One is the um, what's happening in technology, not just in the arts, but sort of globally, right? And the other one is what's happening with the market globally, right? Because we're entering into some pretty uncharted territory here where we've, we're increasingly in a world where just a small percentage is holding the entire world's, world's wealth, right? So. It, and then we're also entering a world where almost all experiences, experiences that used to be very large, like going to opera, right, can now be experienced right here, <laughs> right, Hello. this small. Yeah. It, I think, um, and I'm wondering what, is it possible that, is it possible to achieve these dreams when almost 
all of the experiences are now being mediated. You see what I mean? Like, is it possible to do these things? And is it possible to achieve these dreams when what we're ending up dealing with now is um, uh, is basically our, our, at least our market society approaching now at the same level it was just before the French Revolution, right? Where we have just about 5% in control of most of the wealth, right? Or, or they say one person in the village holds 99% of the wealth. Are these going to be possible in this world that we're entering in? And how are those, how is technology addressing these issues, especially since you, you're, you're working in technology within an arts organization that wants to bring people to a larger group experience. We're in Carnegie Hall, mm -hmm. not Carnegie Channel, right? <laughs> so I'm, uh, there's oh, a we Carnegie Channel too. <laughs> oh, there's, oh, yeah, and I watched it, and I watched it too, <laughs> on my device. But, so I have a, a million, there's so many things I want to know, right? And so I'm going to throw that out there, I'm going to throw that out there, and the third thing I'm going to throw out there is TED Talks, because there is no TED Talks for music right now. There's nothing that reaches as many people, the creative, classes as to at that level of TED Talks that I know of. Maybe there are that I just don't know of yet. But I think um, they incorporate artists. I mean, they, it's all different. Like, I they know do, they incorporate it, but I mean, I know it's technology and For entertainment examples. And design. You know, but as examples. Yeah, as examples of the big thing. But anyway, yeah. I'll stop talking. I'm just curious what, I know that we all have strong feelings about where things are, might be going. This, um, the, sorry, this side of the table again. <laughs> um, that with the, the, the speaking about the market economy, uh, something I noticed whilst I was at Conservatoire, and that's how I ended up going to business school afterwards as well. I was trying to get um, an understanding of what's the corporate world, how how our politics run, why do people act like they do, why do we live in this system which we've developed um, of money and transaction and it, it, it kills people it's bizarre um a very quick anecdote i watched the documentary on dolphins and she was talking to my students about this and one of my students started bursted out laughing and said <laughs> imagine those dolphins who socially speaking are very comparable to to us um when they start shoving shelves towards each other shells towards each other um to protect against sharks for example it's an absurd idea that animals would start doing that kind of exchange, and that's exactly what we do. <laughs> On the other side, talking, talking about the money, um, we, li we like to think in currencies. Um, and, and money is basically just a, a collection of all that. But what is it that then really counts? My, my mother says, look, wow, everybody thinks you're incredibly rich because you travel around the world and uh, she's one of the few people who knows there's actually nothing on my bank account. Um, this is expanding now. <laughs> Mum, you're not the only one anymore. Um, but um, th my, my reply to her surprised myself. I said, yes, Mum, but I'm one of the richest people on earth when it comes to goodwill. So I mean, I've done lots for people. People do things back. And d don't even take that. I don't count that. You don't count goodwill. Um, but because I believe in something, express it, other people do so as well, and that's, that's where we're going, that's what brings us here together. And in taking technology, in taking the market economy, um, do, do we need it? Do we need everything to globalise? Do, do, does it have to be a channel? Or could we go back into sort of saying, well, how about small groups? How about smaller communities? And, and that's spreading. It's also a very big question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but mm -hmm. the, the launching that. But that's that's where last thing, and then I really am shutting up. But I'll try at least. Um, I had the honour of, of speaking with uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi, um, who took me by surprise when he said, "Music is like a religion. In fact, music is a religion. It's something you can't you can't feel it. It's always gone, but it does something with people, as does any kind of god, as does any religion." But what a religion does is it structures a society and tries to keep them from, except some extreme sides of it, but it tries to keep them from uh, killing each other and protecting the community. Can we draw that comparison to music and actually make it something that does uh, protect and uh, grow communities? If we make it 
uh, uh, accessible and uh, non non sectarian, which is the huge problem with with any religion now. Uh, the at least the uh, this, this amazing uh, gravitation toward fundamentalism uh, and uh, and irrational uh, hatred that comes out. I don't know. I mean, would would music of itself be something which is naturally inclusive rather than in, in something you know all embracing and liberal, or would or would it have its own uh, narrow definitions? I mean, it certainly it does. Has. <laughs> but but I experienced like you would <laughs> arguments about the divisions, you know, so, within yeah. music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I experienced in uh, traveling to places where uh, people are very poor. Um, I'm, of course, a totally rich man, if you compare it with that situation. But the fact that I came there, not to bring stuff, but actually to ask, like, I want to listen to your music. Um, by the way, I carry my viola. <laughs> so we see what happens. And that fact what turned the whole relationship upside down. Yeah. Because <laughs> after a while you feel like there's more, there's more, <laughs> and then you expand, is it? <laughs> so um, um, music being something, of course, uh, like love, it grows when you give it away. Um, but also it is something that if you uh, take it from others, those people are empowered. And if I am from the Red Cross, which is, is of course important work, but if I give things, I take away their dignity. This is the way how a refugee told me mm -hmm. that he hated uh -huh. to get help. He hated being a victim. He was supposed to be the father of a family, mm -hmm. to be responsible, but now he's all receiving, he's just holding up his hand. It's the most humiliating thing. So when I came, I asked like, I want to, I need you for, to, to, well, for my music project, I, uh, can you, do you have something to give to me? Then he said like, okay, I give you my music and you give me my dignity back in this way. I mean, it's, it's a s small thing, but it, about exchange, yeah, I, I, I read on markets how we buy things, there is opposite stuff that is, yeah, goodwill, but also how the giving creates dignity. So I have a question, which is this example that you've given of going into this town and asking for this man's creativity, and and this is a way of kind of he's able to be empowered by this. And also, you also uh, mentioned visiting a similar region of the world several several times. So I'm curious because I know a lot of a lot of people in this room have. There's many ways of following up with experiences like that and the beginnings of a relationship but that there's many many examples of ways to have it be a continuous relationship but then there's a lot of really isolated um, periods of times where you do that for a very short period of time and then you never see that person again um, and I'm what I'm curious well and that was actually my biggest question is like and I already know there are examples of continued relationships with um, people with either places where there's political unrest or neighborhoods that have a larger need for certain cultural, um, uh, for, yeah, just for certain culture and art. Um, but just like what are the ways, of, like what my question is, or what are the most effective ways of harvesting a really continued relationship with, with communities and like really person, like interpersonal, like really between like keeping the same people like or kind of uh, an hierarchy of, or a succession of people where there's really consistency there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it will be a dilemma, I feel. I mean, I left so, such a lot of situations behind with uh, such a lot of pain that like, ah, I want to keep the connection. Same moment, I want to continue and reach to more people or to, to find different situations or even design things with more impact. There's a big tension there. And, uh, well, it's of course also a reason that, that I'm passionate to, to share these experiences. And I imagine maybe in a while we make a conference with people also from really strategic uh, 
with strategic brains who think, for example, we are piloting all the time. In, in the, let's say, startup world, it's what we do. We make a pilot here, and we said, okay, that worked. Now we design a new pilot. I only did pilots. I only did projects that I did myself that, that couldn't scale. And I mean, there is great expertise in, in other fields about how to turn a pilot into something that can, can, can scale. <laughs> One pilot who set up was Sirius Mission, yeah. um, which the, was to go there, give workshops to these children with all the benefits that we understand. By now, it's developed into um, an organization that teaches local creatives to continue these workshops, which we as internationals actually gave there, um, which starts feeding itself, which their creativity now comes out. Third level, strategically speaking, what they do is now connect with other parts of the world where also music is being made, where stories are being told, and that exchange with each other. These connections then mean that for the, as well the teachers, as the ones we taught, as well as the children, it gives them a sense of hope of like, hey, we can actually move across, yeah. uh, learn from each other, and maybe also improve it, learn from someone else, apply it here, improve it, and somehow do something about the situation we're in if they're not happy about it. No, I wish I wish I had an answer for that. Um, that g comes under that third part of my thing, the the responsibilities. Um, and I think Sarah can probably speak to this best. <laughs> I don't want to put too much on you, but um, the the and Tom also the the sustainability of these of these efforts requires human power, and it requires maybe I'm thinking. A collaboration between our institutions can help, you know, where, where we'll, somebody will make a, a pilot program somewhere and then one of uh, the sister organizations can, can step in and help uh, uh, expand that and, and um, make it deep and, and, and long lasting, like whether it's you're talking about prisoners or, you know, elderly or whatever, or refugees. Um, and, and the worst thing, I just have to say, everybody knows, knows it, but I mean, the worst thing we can do is go and help these, these little boys here and then leave. Yeah. It's the worst thing you can do, or especially, that, that's why, you know, the famous uh, thing that we have right now of, of this uh, of girl, Aya, who wrote this and performed this beautiful rap uh, poem song. Uh, which immediately elicited three beautiful compositions from my from my students, from my bridge students. Um, what happens there? You know, do, first of all, the, she or as a, as a symbol. I know she's not because you you did make sure that she's not in danger from a tribal elder who who want, doesn't believe that girls should should express themselves. Uh, you know, where where we go, it's going to require a lot of human uh, hours, manpower, whatever, yeah. Yeah, people, to, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm just it's, it's throwing that open because I, I, I don't want to make a, a huge, you know, great thing, look what we did in this one locality, you know, oh, wow, well, we changed this dozen kids' lives around, you know, I don't know, give, give me some, some thoughts on that. It's making me think a little bit, John. Um, sometimes to have the most impact, you need to work in a place where there is some infrastructure like in place. You can't always go to the places yeah. that are dealing with so many, I'm thinking about schools, yeah. um, when there are so many issues within a school building, um, it's sometimes not really possible to start there and if you start in a place where there's some functionality and some systems that are in place and the, the human power that you're talking about is already working you're not in, you're not inventing from zero and if you can get something to take place and then kind of go upwards and downwards and sideways from there in the growth um, I think that might be more of a model for sustainability rather than sort of like finding the absolute most needy place and doing a one-shot and then you're yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, 
there is value mm -hmm. to providing a rich, collaborative, musical experience for people who are in a really challenging yes. environment, even if you can't sustain it right. forever. Right. Okay. There's still value in that, and, and you have to, like, you know, you can, one cannot take responsibility for everything for everyone. Right. Right, and we've thought about this a lot. Yeah. We've thought about it a lot around the juvenile justice work and the correctional work, and I've pushed really hard here for us to build pathways for young people. Mm -hmm. But you also have to believe that it's powerful and important for people to have the opportunity to collaborate with artists and make something that is their own and you know do that work for however long it lasts. In some cases, it might last you know, for a very brief period of time. In some cases, it might take place for six months or an entire year. When that is over, if we have taken care of, of the opening, of setting the expectations, of managing the expectations, of being clear about what the departure is going to be, that, that there is still value in that kind of thing. And not everything can be sustained. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to have some faith that people whatever situation they're in, whatever environment they're in, have innate capacity to find strength in those experiences and to find their way of following them through, yeah. even when they're living in, right. you know, in horrific yeah. situations. Do you, do you have a capacity to at least stay in touch on some level? In some cases. In some cases, it's not legally possible. Mm -hmm. I, the, my biggest failure? was when there were uh, uh, kids in classes, there was a, a Roma school in uh, Slovakia, mm -hmm. and Gypsy Ghetto. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I started the program, well, a long story, but anyway, we started with musicians, and at the moment we entered the building, the teacher said, great, we're off. So the oh. teachers oh. are all oh. sitting oh. in the teacher room oh. drinking oh. coffee. That happened all over oh. the world. Oh. And we oh. were oh. dead. We all had that. <laughs> Well, and I think this was my most, well, the uh, uh, biggest mistake, because they are there to stay. Even right. if the children... They are your partners. In five yeah. years, the right. children are all gone, and yeah. the teacher is still there. Yeah. So if there, there's your sustainability. Right. But there's I think the, right. as artists, the tools that we use as artists, like the creative problem solving, the creative critical thinking, I mean, I think if we can, or even just the discipline, like I've been telling my middle schoolers, you don't have to want to do it, you just have to do it. You can't let your feelings govern you. <laughs> do you think about it that I didn't feel like practicing? You know, like you just have to do it, like just giving them tools of what they would need to get better. So I think creative arts really can give the tools and working with an artist who can relate to yeah. someone. You know, and I, I believe, I mean, in uh, different teachers, they have their own challenges and music can really help, for example, make children count. <laughs> or make uh, tell about geography or history, you know? Music is, I mean, that's why I hope to really uh, abandon music as a subject, <laughs> just integrate it anywhere, you know? And say, like, where do we need it? Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to push back on that because I hope we don't abandon music as a subject. I don't think it's very interesting if the only way that kids ever encounter music is so that they can learn yeah. math. Yeah. And that is a big problem in this country, yeah. Yeah. that music integration, people say, oh, well, that's, don't worry, they're learning music in American history. They sang that song last yeah. week. <laughs> it was really great. Even that, more. you know, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't look for rich yeah. opportunities yeah. for connections to happen with other subjects, but music on its own as a discipline yeah. has enormous value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, in, in my mind, it is where there is the big questions, where we need creativity and where we need connection, for example, with different cultures, then the brains are not enough. So imagine in the school thing, you have a different culture, even in your own neighborhood, a clash of yeah. cultures. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if there are musicians part of thinking how to address it, so that it's not just talking and debating it, it's also jamming. <laughs> And there comes my, my feeling that it, it can really be um, uh, connected to the, the daily life and not isolated in a kind of hobby or performing arts career uh, site. So of course I will not abandon it, but if I can step by step integrate it and even make it flourish, of course that's, uh, that would be a dream. <laughs> Musical strange. 
<laughs> and why? Because on the one hand, I'll jump off. It's quite. It's um. It's quiet on this side. This is one way of changing it. Um, but on the other hand, um, what also happens is I think this might make this memorable. <laughs> because otherwise we've had another meeting of two hours at a table talking about things that we do care about but it's one of them and what we manage to do as artists whether it's music or whether it's any other kind of art form um, is to actually imprint something in the memory and that is something that will have impact then it becomes something sustainable then it's something that these children will look at or talk about or even maybe 10 years later, go, oh, remember that weird moment? <laughs> but what did it actually mean when they are crossing a border because they have to flee their country? Or oh, whatever. And um, it's, um, I was also, because we've been talking a lot, thought, well, <laughs> <laughs> let's just do something different now. Um, but isn't that the attitude that we need? Because we're acting as incredible, intelligent uh, professionals, well-educated, and we're having a relatively structured meeting, slash brainstorm, um, isn't it our responsibility to actually, th this attitude, uh, to share that and to be able to give that to the children, to whichever target audience we, we want to reach? Well, Richard, Car <laughs> Richard Carrick made the point earlier, he left, but Richard made that point, was that his interest, um, just to restate it, was about the intensity of the artistic experience, right? And it's you're walking on the table is a is a similar kind of feat, right? <laughs> to try to intensify the experience in a certain way at a certain moment. And I do think that that is, I do think that's really really important. And it's a reason to strive for artistic quality and it's a reason to strive for um, opening up uh, the imagination um, in this work. Uh, so I, I, I agree with all of that. I agree with all that. I think, we're, you know, we, we've got some other sort of larger issues here, too, that we're trying, that we're struggling with, some of which Justin, you know, brought up um, around the, the crisis that, that John mentioned before and what kind of, what are the kind of the components of that crisis. And they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're complicated issues. But I agree with you. I think, you know, at, at the same time, the intensity of the artistic experience is something that can open things up. And we can also, because this is just inside this room, but even, however big the problems, whether we're sitting at the table with, uh, how great would it be if um, Obama did this on a, on a global summit? That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how would that throw things? How would that, th that's, that's the way that impacts. Yeah, that reminds me. Yeah, the, the question is, is the, imagine this is the, the stage, uh -huh. someone can enter the stage and feel comfor comfortable, he's also of course claiming a certain role, like I am skilled enough to enter it, or I am con confident enough. And that's what happens a lot in current art education, that of course very well uh, experienced children climb up and claim like, wow, this is what I can do. And it's, it's empowering, but it can also be limiting if you're not there and you are if you're shy uh, that 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 performing art is like claimed or occupied by very outgoing types and also then boxing it off from more introvert types i kind of wanted to change the conversation around a little bit we've been talking a lot about integration the market technology and our, our challenges and our dreams etc I would love to hear, since we have so many experts here, what are the things that you've done that have worked, that we can maybe inspire each other to do similar things, to collaborate, or just sort of extend our reach? So I'm just really curious, like, what are some of the things that you guys have done with your work that have really made an impact to you personally and also to the community? I think, Bill, you're up. Yes. <laughs> I'm up. You're the only person. You're up. You're the only person that hasn't spoken. So Doc. Oh, Doc. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Doc is. He's. I can tell he's planning a. Mind-blowing statement. Which is why he was asking Bill to. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the. Um, you know, I, I was just I, I was just doing storytelling, and you know, I, I 
school in Tribeca. Right. I, I worked in pre-K, K, first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, and did different curriculum with each of those grades. And, and um, the kids remember the stories year to year. I go there once a year. And the third graders say, would you tell us that story you told us a year ago? Mm -hmm. So the notion that you, you can't make any impact in a small amount of time, because sometimes, you know, what made me want to be a musician, I still remember, was this one guy singing in a little place in Virginia, singing in Dublin's fair city where girls are so pretty, and I still can hear him <laughs> singing that. Yeah. And that affected me doing music as much as any class, and that was one morning for one song. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we need to automatically kind of globalize any of those notions, you know, is sometimes you have the opportunity to have that kind of impact and sometimes, and it, and it varies, and, and sometimes you need to have enough time with somebody to find that music story or that. I worked with a, a guy from Burundi who started the Village Health Works. Mm. And he said, I don't have any stories, they're all sad. <laughs> they're all sad, I don't remember. I said, well, we're doing this benefit, let me tell some stories from Burundi. He said, I don't have any. And we went out to dinner a year and a half later, and we're talking, and he starts remembering his grandfather telling stories to him. And it's still there, you know, so sometimes it's, it's setting up the circumstance so that adult, or the kid can find that moment that they are really present. And I think all of us have that. I think that's why, hopefully, we all kind of have that gift in different ways, and that's why we're doing the work we're doing. I'm going to be Bill's agent for a minute and <laughs> let you in. Bill's being very humble about his, his, um, his skills here and his experience, but I'm going to be his agent for a second and tell you about something that Bill's, I can tell you why those kids remembering a story from a year later, right? Because that, I got really excited when you said that, because isn't that really the game that we're in, right? Is <laughs> what can we do to, like, I, of course, I am going to remember you walking across this table. It's like, clearly, clearly, clearly we'll connect decades from now. But, um, but the, the thing about what Bill's doing is a very subtle, philosophical technique, and you do it too, Tom. And this is, this is the thing. When Bill tells a story to a bunch of kids, right, Bill comes in with the ownership of the story. Bill's the storyteller. They're all sitting there, they're excited to hear the story. Because right at that moment, the story is someplace else, and Bill's going to tell it, and he's going to bring it into the room. But as Bill's telling the story, if you watch him do it, there'll be some very subtle shifts where the kids all of a sudden have to do something in order to keep the story going. They have to no longer be students, they have to actually be, not characters in the story, but they have to somehow participate in this artwork, right? And it's so subtle that by the end of this, I've seen you do it many, many times in some of the work that we do together, where the story is going along and he'll say, and guess what happened? And all the kids go, the something, something, something. <laughs> That's right, and when he took the thing, how many times did he do it? Four times. Let's count them. One, two, three, four. And what happened to the whatever? It all fell asleep. It all fell asleep. Now he's not telling them to do that, right? But through this very subtle technique of transferring the story from this thing that is out there through you, and now it's living with them. Um, the reason I'm bringing it up is because it's what's been most, you, to answer your question, like what are we doing that's most effective, right? What I've seen um, while Music Institute do that's most effective is it, it seems to take the experience of the concert hall, and that rich experience, bring it into the out, outside community so that other people that otherwise wouldn't have a chance get to experience that, right? The cool thing that Tom does in his classes is that they get to the end and they're like, they're like, wow, you know, we, f we feel great about what we just did, right? We feel like we just, we're ha like we did something great, you know? And it's one of Tom's most subtle techniques that it, which is, you know, something as you know, I struggled with from the beginning is not to make it the Justin show and make it the kids show, 
right? Because they don't need another person to be at the front and be a star. Like they want to be the stars. And you know, I've seen it dozens of dozens of times with your work where the students feel like we made the theme, we made the piece, right? Instead of like, oh yeah, that guy's awesome that came in with work and worked with us because he's a genius composer. Which is also true, but it's just that you see, you see what I'm getting at? Like I'm yeah, trying to answer what the big, what these big questions. Yeah, it's ownership. something through the participation, yeah. but it's a very specific kind of participation. It's not like I do this, then you do this, then I do this, then you do this. You did it wrong. Get out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> something, something different. And maybe I don't know. David can speak to that too yeah, about definitely. about what's happening in in your new experiences. I'm like, what? I don't know. But anyway, thanks for letting me be yeah. Bill's agent for Thank you. Yeah. And, and if you want, if you want, if we're really good, Bill can lead us in one of these stories <laughs> to illustrate, <laughs> to illustrate the, tech, the subtle technique of taking art from out here, going here, and then into all of us. And we'll, we, we will remember it a year from now, I guarantee you, if we're good. <laughs> if we're good. <laughs> Convinced. Anyway. Take it back. Well, you said what I think is the, the answer to Wendy's question about what works. I think we've all seen when you make the learner or the audience the center and you support their experience rather than your own. It's like I remember seeing uh, someone showed me this thing of Conan O'Brien going to like a kindergarten and teaching a blues lesson. And it was, it was the Conan O'Brien show. It wasn't mm -hmm. about the kids at all. And they thought it was cool. But it's like, no, he's not. He's trying to be entertaining and get laughs and things. And there's nothing happening in terms of what would happen in one of our blues workshops or something, which is about, well, how can you empower people to realize uh, something? You know, and I think that's, that's what's so good about the work that's going on, you know, where you do make this one girl able to pour out her soul through the means of, of music and art. And I, I think one thing that I am noticing in our conversation, which has, is something that I would not have known had I not had some really interesting and frustrating experiences in Japan, but mm -hmm. I, I think we have a real Western bias with how we think in terms of art, where it is like, this is a very 20th or 21st century, or 19th century, you know, sort of model, but that art is a means of self-expression, or the importance of art is to innovate. And that is a very modernistic and Western sort of thing. And if we only think that sort of way, we're turning our back on a lot of the way a lot of the rest of the world functions, or the way the philosophies are. Where and the positioning. Of yes, the exactly. Cultures. Where let's, it's like where you know a more Confucian idea is that music is an expression of nature, mm -hmm. or that's that's the purpose of art is to to reflect nature or reality in the most beautiful idealized form or in many cultures how music is a means of uh, worship, or a means of meditation, a means of um, passing us through one stage of life to the other. I mean, Tom has this beautiful solo piece called Passages, and it, it reminded me that, yeah, there, these major moments in life, whether it's a wedding, a bar mitzvah, or a, a funeral, you don't have these things without music. You know, I mean, traditionally, that's, that's always how it's been. Or it's like, even in the pop culture, the songs are a soundtrack of our life, you know. And it's, it's those kinds of things that, you know, make me think about, well, are we too limited in what our definition of, of music is or what arts education is? I mean, the thing that's, you asked about my current work, I mean, the thing that is um, really wild is, you know, we we always were taught by Tom and John and Eric Booth that you know what's your co-learners, everyone is bringing expertise and all this stuff. But it's like I'm now in a position where okay, I've got this doctor from Juilliard and everything. I'm supposedly a music expert, <laughs> but my my lessons are different from every single student. Where I've got a student who's a violist who brought in her. She said, I want to learn Billy's Bounce, and I'm transcribing Charlie Parker's solo from the record because I don't want to cheat and look at the Omni book. And he plays it, and needs some work and stuff, but I'm still thinking, geez, I'm supposed to teach you bebop. But I mean, the thing is, it's, it, my department's a village where it's like, okay, 
here's the next steps, eight steps for you, then you're going to Daryl Anger and going to hit him up in an office hour or something like that. So there's this shared communal sense of nurturing all the students' experience. And the thing that's interesting was I learned that from the dance division in Juilliard where Tom and I taught like for 12 years, you know. And after 12, the 12th year, I'm thinking, I can't do this another year. But the thing that was amazing is that department has, uh, it's unlike the other divisions at, at Juilliard in that you have an incredible diversity of students. You have some who were classically trained in ballet since the time they were three with very refined technique. Never created their own phrase in their own in life, never danced these other styles. Okay, you've gotten a phenomenally talented student from inner city Brooklyn, never had much arts education, but boy, do they have some incredible moves learned on the street. You have someone else who's been brought up on Martha Graham and their dream was to start their own dance company. And the thing that was kind of amazing is um, the entire dance division would nurture these students' education. They would study with all the faculty. They would go through paces in modern, in ballroom, in classical ballet. They would ha all of them would have to choreograph, graph, like it or not, even if they didn't want that to be their profession, that was part of it. And then by the time they're senior year, they have to learn the business skills where they're producing their show from fundraising to lighting to costume design and all this. And that's all guided by this whole team. You know, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting approach where, you know, you, it's like you subvert your own ego to serve someone else and to, to work together as a community and celebrate what's best about everybody. You know, and I always flash back to this thing that Justin used to say in this interactive concert we would do called Sound World, where, you know, <laughs> he would say, um, he, we would open with this, this uh, transcription of an African piece that was written for the, the, the Kronos Quartet. And in the o opening, we'd get the whole audience jamming, clapping, singing along with us. And, and the point is that, you know, that Justin would make is that in African cultures, there's no such thing as an audience and a performer. It's a communal experience. And I think 200 years ago, the same in the West. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and I think that's the, the question is how do we make music a communal thing that everyone shares, everyone owns, and, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an individual experience, and I think that's another danger of media, well, there's some of the advantages of media is to bring everything. We've got the world at our table, but at the same time, people want to be part of it. Be part of it. Part of it. But, you but, know, but media and and digital tools can actually also build community. Absolutely. It's a question of how you use Absolutely. those tools. And who's handling them? Yeah. And I wouldn't mind sharing a, a personal musical experience. Actually, Justin, you can jump in in this conversation um, with, my, do. <laughs> with my ensemble <laughs> classical jam. And kind of, you know, um, like what Dave was talking about, you know, we have the philosophy, philosophy, like many of us audiences are also music makers. And so we were in St. Thomas, and we have this improv workshop. We, we work with different presenters and always do improv workshops with presenters, and so we get everybody to improvise with us, and it doesn't matter what level, whether they sing, whether they, they, they only play one note on, on a percussion instrument, or it doesn't matter what level. And so then we work together and create something, and then we bring them on stage as part of the performance at the end. And in St. Thomas, I remember the presenter said to us very clearly that there was a real divide with the audiences that come. You know, the local audiences don't end up coming. Um, and so, and, and they don't fill up the house either, right? Am I correct? And so with our particular experience, because we engaged the community and engaged the parents and, and the students um, and the locals, um, all of a sudden we had a full house because everybody brought their friends, the people who are performing are bringing their friends to see them and they're participating. And so it's not about like, the performers as performers, and then you come as audience, but you're participating as part of the show. Uh, and that's a model that we've been using, and it's been very successful. Um, and sort of just goes towards what, what Doc was saying, you know, just basically, you know, the, the, the divide between performers and, and 
and presenters even, and audiences and composers, that, that has to be broken down, I think, for us to move forward. And I think it's not, like, because I think when we first started talking, we were thinking about globally, like how are we gonna solve the world problems <laughs> and the whole, like we are responsible as artists to solve everything, and I don't think we can, to be honest. But I think we can start small. And even with that one experience in just St. Thomas, like that was the start for us. And it encourages me personally to do more of this work. So if I can do this here, oh, maybe I can do this in Detroit. Or maybe I can do this uh, in California, whatever. Uh, or, you know, we go to Hong Kong or whatever. You know, just wherever we go. Just a great little example. by little, yeah. one, one classroom by yeah. classroom, one um, performance space to another. So it's maybe a very mundane uh, uh, example. I was in a theater company working on a Hamlet, and I was supposed to just do the music, you know, which is very unnatural for me because I, I tend to design just the whole experience involved. Uh, I, it was a great, great project, so I accepted. Let's 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 work on this. Then I went to the production department and I said, like, okay, we're touring maybe 30 cities in the Netherlands and Belgium. So in every city, I want a local choir to sit among the audience because at a certain moment, the yes. actor starts singing and I want that the audience sings back. Mm-hmm. Production department says... I'm sure they love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> then I say, um, okay, wait a minute. And I went to the marketing department and I said, what would you think if we can announce our show three months ahead saying like, auditions for Hamlet. <laughs> Will people publish that in a newspaper? Sure, yeah, let's do that. So what would be happen if we just uh, recruit in every city and you're, you're there, uh, 15 or, or 20 local singers? And it was a great way, like finally, it's not just sending out the usual flyers and stuff like, okay, we're traveling, please buy our tickets, it's good, some newspaper critic says it's good, so it's good. Mm-hmm. That's how they had to sell the stuff. But now it was different, it was like, who's going to join us? Who, who will be w- with us making Hamlet? And they loved it, they did it, production heard about it later. <laughs> and actually there was not much to be done because we just did it, you know. And they sold also tickets, I mean they got a free ticket themselves, being part of it. But attached to it, they had to promise not to tell their friends that they would participate. It was secret. Because oh, they didn't want to go alone, so their friends were paying. And at a certain moment, they were singing, and the friends were looking like, what? And it all added up, and it was an artistic choice. So they're finally, the, market, the marketing department felt always like no one cared about them. All these artists were together creating something, and the market had to sell it. Uh, that's not a nice job, but now they were involved, you know. <laughs> and I mean, I, I recognize just what you explained yeah. about just filling up the hole by making everyone, yeah, the ownership or, or like in some way related to Rel- being relevant to them, basically. Yeah, it means something to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if that what you said in the sort of I can go and do it there and there and there and there, but maybe all of us can. Mm-hmm. And if we can also explain to others after hearing it from you and experiencing it to other people, that is when it suddenly becomes something mm-hmm. which is indeed much bigger than any individual of us can, can tell, but that's, that's the movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do and feel stuff. like more positive about this whole thing, um, that if all of us just take these little personal stories and experiences and just sort of expand, and like you said, and share it with your friends who are doing similar work, and share your experiences, then everybody does a little bit, then you know, I'm just seeing in my head like how the world will light up. <laughs> Maybe I'm being very, very like positive about it. But I feel like if we take that approach rather than like from, ooh, let's look at the whole thing, the global market and the technology and, yeah. and try to solve all of these issues and starving children and all that. But we go from just little by little. But I would still love to hear more stories. I think this is inspiring. We just had one, John, just yes, had one today. I mean, it just happens. I'm very blessed, you know. Um, Maya Lubetsky, who was a multicultural kid, was uh, so shy. She was exactly as, as I was in fifth grade. Uh, Please don't call on me. <laughs> <laughs> she, 
it in the corner. Even if you know the answer, don't call it. And she's, she's like that very much. And, uh, uh, they worked a lot with her. Rick Carrick worked with her. And, uh, and Maya wrote this beautiful piece, which she doubted all the way to the end. And, uh, and, and the, the harmonies were so, so sweet and beautiful. Uh, and she did her own orchestration. And at the performance, you know, we, we, we scared her to death by telling her she had to, you know, introduce her piece and talk about her piece to the audience. And um, she couldn't even do that in front of us. Mm -hmm. Couldn't, just couldn't say a word. And then she saw the other two kids who were, you know, doing it and um, we just, you know, kept saying, you know, it's nothing wrong, even if you forget what you're going to say, and so or use a cheat, whatever. And I just, uh, I was, I was so thrilled uh, at the, at the response, and the, just that one look on her face. She said, "That wasn't so bad." <laughs> <laughs> she talked to the, to the audience, and it was just a, a, a lovely, lovely uh, experience. And again. It's a one-shot thing. She's not going to be transformed just just by that. You've got to have some consistent communication, and that's what I mean. You don't know that, actually, John. And to go back to the story that you told earlier about the moment when you yeah. knew, well, you he's, he's do a what genius, you do. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to push back around this because I yeah. am responsible for programs that reach hundreds of thousands of people every year mm -hmm. around the world. Yeah. And they cannot all be long-term sustainable experiences. And we have spent a huge amount of time thinking about what the strategic programmatic investment is with every particular constituent, and mm -hmm. in order for it to be as meaningful as it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. And I will just say that, that single experiences can be can be transformative. They can be. We, we all can think of moments in our lives that have been transformed by an experience, a day, for some people, a concert, a lullaby sung by my mother, a, you know, and, and so we cannot take responsibility for sustaining everyone in the pla on the planet's musical experiences <laughs> forever. Like the fact that you, that, that she had that experience today, that's fantastic and it has value. I'm not saying it's not great for her to have multiple experiences like that. Yeah. But even if she never encounters the New York Philharmonic again or very young composers again, who's to say she won't have lots of other experiences? Does she have some agency? I guess, I guess, I, I guess, the, I guess the reason I push back on it, and this is a good discussion. I mean, I'm not trying to make a stand on anything, but I am positing the fact that uh, Tom remembers this in the, in the early days of that. I would come across these kids three years later who had a fantastic experience in the BYC. And, you know, how are you? You know, for instance, don't you remember me? Oh my God, you're like three feet taller. And, you know, and, and what are you doing? And, and a lot of the time I was unsatisfied with <laughs> the, I don't know how to put it, you know, I. I the response to that yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it depends on your goals, John. Mm -hmm. It actually depends on your goals. Mm -hmm. So you personally and the institution that you're working with, etc. If your goal is to meet young people at a particular age and help to support their creativity until they go to university, that's one thing. If your goal is to spark creativity and give young people the experience that acknowledges, oh my gosh, like, wow, I, I'm capable I of things I didn't know. Now. I have these things, I have this voice, I want, you know, and then, then that's a different goal. If you're, I mean, it, you, you can't think of it though in terms of everyone you encounter needing to yeah, 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 become you. composers or whatever, the, or, yeah, or yeah, yeah. have an articulate response to, you know, what, what you're doing in your creative life. And I like I'm I'm being devil's advocate a little bit around this. I believe okay. in sustained long term, you know, engagement. And I think you have to be strategic about where you where you invest in that, okay. with whom right. and what your goals are. Yeah. I think that's what I was trying to allude to, is that it's sometimes about picking the right partner and being strategic about the 
where you where you place right. your energy. Person in the right. Yeah. Person, yeah. Well, yeah. no, not necessarily. It could be a person. It could be an institution. It could be. Mm -hmm. It's just about um, matchmaking in some ways, and and as it relates to goal set goal setting. And it has value. That experience you described that that has enormous value. Take it easy on yourself, John. No. <laughs> <laughs> you at the same time, I mean, the other side of that is that John's art is dissatisfaction, right, led to the creation of a whole right. program which yeah. helped, you know, to create some sustainable uh, experiences for kids along the way. So it's not, it's not, um, you know, without value yeah. either. Um, you know, as you're saying, institutions then have to make decisions about what they're going to support and be strategic right. um, about that. And as artists, luckily, we're free to be really dissatisfied with our own work. <laughs> <laughs> so there is ten minutes maybe left. Uh, I would, I would love to really think what can be a next step. I mean, in. It would be lovely to have more conversations and longer and everything, but can there be something that we can strive for that we can together make happen that can really help us forward? Is there something that we can, I mean, I, I wish I can, well, stay connected, of course, at least, but. Okay. I, I don't, yeah. contact I don't think that like <laughs> more conversations, like, um, very curated conversations, like a continuous conversation among people like us would be helpful, even just through Skype or whatever, mm -hmm. Google Plus, whatever, mm -hmm. Facebook. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I also think it's really helpful when we share our work. Like for me, just now just hearing all of your stories, that's very inspiring because I'm, think, I'm thinking, well, how can I use some of the work that you've done and see how it works for me personally as a musician or my organization. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also thinking, how can I collaborate? Which goes back to the original conversation. How can we collaborate with each other? And actually on top of that is, yeah, just everybody, like, there's, yeah, this collaboration between institutions where you do have a kid where they did a, a program that was a short-term program, but you, yeah. have, uh -huh. you can I identify some, somebody who's like, yeah, this kid wants to continue or this person mm -hmm. wants to continue. Okay, there's this organization that's going to help you develop yeah, this and yeah. there's this one that's going to like and like kind of, which I think happens a lot already. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. But I guess just for everybody else, for like, yeah. just for other people that could to continue to like be aware of what's out there and who's mm -hmm. specifically doing what. Um, no, I was just going to say, I, I, you know, that um, there is one structure that it might, we might contemplate um, using, um, I guess it was two a year ago. There was um, an international teaching artist conference yeah. in Australia. Yeah, it was last. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be another one coming in yep. 2016. Yeah, in, in, in Scotland. Scotland. In Scotland. Well, at least and we can get a plane ticket. And there. Then well, and one of the things is yeah. one of the things is that right now, as I as I as I understand it, I mean, and I don't know all the the deep ins and outs, but there's not particularly um, a dedicated stream to musical creativity. Mm. Um, and it might be interesting within that, in other words, it's a broader thing, it's gonna involve you know, teaching artists from the theater and from dance and from the visual arts, mm. right? And, and from music. Um, and even among music artists, you know, there are lots of different kinds of projects that go on, you know, El Sistema, which tends to be more performance oriented, mm -hmm. but does have some you know, um, compositional um, elements to them in, in so, but it would be interesting if we could suggest to the International Teaching Artists Conference itself, hey, what if we <laughs> had a meeting and we expanded our circle a little bit and we're able to kind of hone some of our questions and think about what it is that would be really useful to those of us who are trying to inspire musical creativity in others. Yeah, that's we it, that's a great goal. Yeah. I like that, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. We can help make that happen mm. in communication with the leadership and put people in touch. Yeah, yeah I like that. That's a great idea. And also, is there a way for us to keep in touch after this conversation? We'll do an annual summit. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I'll just say from Carnegie Hall's perspective that we host discussions with artists who we're collaborating with all the time. There are about 80, 90 artists who are doing work across these various programs and we we host professional development sessions w which are co-designed um, with artists and 
um, very much about um, about the challenges we're facing, about bringing experts who are um, who can help build understanding around particular topics like trauma in young people, for example. Um, share share creative work that's happening, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a, a big, big, big strand of that kind of thing that's happening. And I will say that one thing that, that has occurred to me a couple times during this conversation is um, maybe we should have a, a more regular forum that is open to artists who are doing this work and interested in um, connecting with colleagues. And I don't know what that would look like. I also wonder, um, but we could contemplate that. Um, for people who are here anyway. Um, and I also think that there might be some opportunities online just to have a, a place to, um, to share questions, challenges, whatever it is that people want to share. I will say that I'm not, we've had some experience trying to build online communities yeah. and um, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. We, we do have a platform though that have, you know, which, I don't know, are, Tom is in that, is in Musical Exchange, Justin has been, have you been in Musical Exchange? Um, I've it's, never done Musical Exchange. It's a platform for um, for young people to connect around music making, and we have people all over the world is who participate. Yours? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's ours, and yeah. um, that's just another place. There might be, maybe there should be a group for artists there, maybe there already is, I don't know, just for yeah. Tom. <laughs> There's an educator group that is very quiet. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there could, or there could be an artist's group. There are a lot of artists who lead creative work completely on the online space within that community. Yeah. Um, so I just throw those things out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I know how a very clear uh, goal like uh, Scotland can really help focusing yeah. things. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, that's very concrete. Is there a place of, I mean, imagine that we can publish even very short stories that we experience. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the experience. Teaching Artist teaching Journal. Journal is a okay, publication yeah. here in the US. Okay, yeah. Yeah, mm. that's American. It's a great yeah. platform yeah. and because then then I mean America. I would love to 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 describe things that that well uh, I experienced for such a place instead of typing emails to you, you know? because uh, I know that email is killing everybody. Uh, I will though, of course, I love I mean to to maybe some of the examples that we gave mm -hmm. to illustrate it with some links and to make sure we all got it. Mm -hmm. That uh, would be great that we have the, the links right. and that we uh, yeah, design yeah. it. And I, I also do, I, I write a column called The Teaching Artist for Chamber Music Magazine. Actually, Classical Jam has been you know featured and mentioned in that column before and other so if there are stories you know I'm always happy to it's just a it's just a conduit but it's a regular thing and it's you know published four times a year yeah. and goes out to all the chamber you know chamber musicians who are members of Chamber Music America okay yes yeah. you know just enough time for Bill to do a story. Please <laughs> 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 no. Oh, come on, Bill. It would be such a great way to end it. <laughs> okay, there you go. You have to echo. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry. hungry. You have to put your hand on it. Why don't you cook? Why, Why don't you cook? cook? I'm the tallest. I'm the tallest. tallest. Hey now, look. Hey now, look. look. We're talking food. We're talking, We're talking food. food. Not size. Not, Not size. size. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry. hungry. Why don't you cook? Why don't you cook? I'm the tallest. I'm the tallest. Hey now, look. Hey now, look. We're talking food. We're talking food. Not size. Not, Not size. size. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry. hungry. Why don't you cook? Why don't you cook? I'm the tallest. I'm the tallest. Hey now, look. Hey now, look. We're talking food. We're talking food. Not size. Not size. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Why don't you cook? Why don't you cook? I'm the tallest. I'm the tallest. Hey now, look. Hey now, look. Says. Too much fuss. Too, Too much fuss. Too much fight. Too, Too much fight. See you later. See you See later. later. Good night. Good night. Boing. 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 And ever since the thumb has lived apart from that. <laughs> 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 and that's why. That's a West African part. <laughs> Yeah. That's a dream of mine. Do you really want to do that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a dream. Mine is a dream. Sarah could probably get you the gig, but I don't know if you want it. I see Vayner doing it. Sarah, we're talking about Vayner. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
great. There's one thing, there's one thing which, I, which strikes me as absolutely amazing is our um, the, your all, all leadership personalities but in such a completely different way. <laughs> and so some of them are rather extravagant, others rather introverts, but can switch it as well. Um, and, but, but with such a respect and such a, a sort of interest in each other. And if we can do that at this table and do it at all the other tables that we do, you don't have to walk over them. <laughs> then, um, then for me, this was an incredibly interesting and, and unforgettable learning experience. So thank you. Wow. Yeah. I'm grateful that you have all made time. And great to know you now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for Please, tomorrow night, 9 o'clock. Zenkel mm Hall. -hmm. It will be a big, 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 nice, great uh, concert with Chronos Quartet and 40 teenagers. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, which yeah, who are is in the, um, what is the name of the object? Ah, Face the Music. Yeah, Face the Music, ah, which is uh, really great. They're doing so such great Jenny, work. Jenny Under Public, yeah. 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 So she's, oh, she's doing it with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's also the reason why I will start running soon oh, right, right. because yeah, today you're yeah, rehearsing right. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah do we need to get tickets beforehand or can we get them at the door or I that? would get them it's, it, the process is sold out yeah so I have one for this I have one for <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I collected a few uh, yeah tell you remember yeah how did you get it I I saw I saw I saw I saw I saw it's been a little surreal. It's like when I got here last night, I kind of realized it was a little bit of 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 a